Good morning, everyone. Um, everyone's had a chance for a break, and I guess we can get started now. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I, th I specifically want to thank uh, Vinay um, for the wonderful work that he's doing through the Vinay Tara Foundation. Uh, that's absolutely amazing. And as uh, Dr. Venugopal mentioned, a lot of us would like to do those things, but it's, uh, it's a different thing about wanting to do and actually having the energy and the enthusiasm to kind of carry that through. So you already um, had a wonderful uh, two talks um, covering the, the, the bigger hematological malignancy, which is the lymphoma. Now we move on to the next most common hematological malignancy, which is the multiple myeloma. And a lot has happened in this disease over the past decade, and I'm just going to try and highlight uh, some of the most important changes that have happened over the past decade. Uh, I don't have a slide on disclosures, but I do have um, research support from Celgene, Novartis, Onyx, um, uh, Millennium for a variety of clinical trials. So um, I think this slide kind of captures what has essentially happened in this um, area over the past 10 to 15 years. Now, as you can see in the bottom four lines, not a significant change had happened in the several decades before 2000. And since 2000, there has been a dramatic progress in terms of overall survival of patients with multiple myeloma due to a variety of different reasons. Now, this is data from Mayo Clinic, but the data from other institutions as well as CR database-based studies again confirm these trends. So what has changed? Several things. I think there's definitely a better understanding of the disease biology and the disease evolution. There is increasingly focus on the concept of early intervention, though this is not ready for prime time yet. We have better and more reliable risk stratification systems. We have novel drugs with uh, very unique mechanisms of action, many of which can be combined together to uh, create very effective regimens. And increasingly, there is the concept of prolonged therapy uh, in this group of patients, as you heard with lymphoma with maintenance strategies. So um, I'm not sure if this audience response is going to work for this, but um, let's just take the first case here. It's a 65-year-old ma uh, man who basically was noted to have total, elevated total protein, underwent additional evaluation, normal hemoglobin, normal creatinine, and normal calcium levels. He has a monoclonal protein of 1.2 gram per deciliter IgG kappa, and serum FLC uh, kappa of 21, lambda of 12, um, both uh, within the pretty close to the normal range there. 24 a urine protein lactophoresis shows 90 milligrams of um, total protein, and a metastatic bond survey is normal. So which of the following is the best course of action? Reassure the patient that uh, he has a benign condition, needs no additional follow-up. Let me see, let's see if we can make this work, then maybe we can do that. All right, let's see. Okay, so there's the choices. So it looks like the majority of the people would go with uh, C which is, let me see if I can go back to the slides here. Oh, slides in there. Um, so the reassure the patient has a benign condition that uh, has a small um, risk of progressing into myeloma and that um, he needs to have it checked annually. So clearly, this here we are dealing with a patient who has a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So this is obviously the most common condition that we um, see in the clinic in terms of if we just randomly take a person with a monoclonal protein that was detected, the vast majority of these patients are going to have a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So um, now when we look at myeloma, it's, it's a paradigm, it's a spectrum of uh, diseases that starts with just the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. A small proportion of these patients can progress through what we call a small ring multiple myeloma, which is more of a transitional phase, and a proportion of those patients then go on to develop symptomatic disease. And what really changes over this uh, spectrum is the proportion of malignant cells and also uh, the functional end organ damage that arises from these um, malignant cells. Now, what is the risk of progression? So if you look at the patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, we are looking at a 1% risk of progression per year for, every, for, for their entire life. It's not, it's not a risk that goes away. So if you are diagnosed with MAGUS today, your risk of getting myeloma in the next year is 1%. If you had it for 20 years, your risk of getting myeloma in the 21st year is still 1%. So it's a very steady uh, risk that never changes during the lifetime of the person. In contrast, when you look at the upper curve here, um, 
which is um, the small ring multiple myeloma patients, it's a very different story. So the, during the first five uh, years after diagnosis, uh, there's about a 50% risk that patient is going to develop um, symptomatic multiple myeloma. Now, during the subsequent five years, what you can see is there's about another 20% um, or so patients who have a risk of progressing onto multiple myeloma. And once you can cross that 10 year mark, you, what, um, the risk of progression, this line is almost parallel to what you're seeing with the muggers. So what we, what essentially what happens during the 10 years, we are identifying the people who really has truly muggers versus the ones who have already undergone that malignant switch to multiple myeloma. So what happens, I think, uh, as we understand the biology better, it's very clear that it's not just a change that happens in the cells. Clearly there are clonal plasma cells right from the beginning, and there are cells which are clonal but more malignant, which increases in numbers, and this clonal so-called benign plasma cells slowly go away. And there are changes that happens in the tumor microenvironment, both in terms of modulation of the immune system, the increased angiogenesis, changes in the bone structure, and so forth, all of which facilitates uh, this progression to symptomatic disease. Now, the standard uh, approach or the clinical practice today is, as we already talked about the patient, patients with muggers, we watch them, we do the testing at least once every year. And we know there are some patients, especially the ones with IgG kappa monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance with very small M spikes, less than one, their risk of progression is substantially lower than the one percent. And so those, some of those patients can be followed maybe even once every three years. In contrast, patients with small to multiple myeloma should be followed much more closely, especially after the initial few years after their diagnosis, uh, where they need to be checked at least once every three to six months. Now, the question that always comes up is, now, you know, myeloma is probably one of the few malignancies where you have a very well-defined precancerous stage, but we don't do anything about it. We just watch them. And obviously, there are good reasons for doing that because the vast majority of the people don't develop anything. But that's different for patients with high-risk smoldering disease. So this trial was done by the Spanish group who randomized patients with high-risk smoldering multiple myeloma based on uh, some flow-based definitions um, to either getting lenalidomide dexamethasone or just observation, which is the standard of care. And they were able to show that patients who were actually randomized to lenalidomide and dexamethasone actually not only had an improved progression-free survival or time to symptomatic disease, but they also had improved overall survival. Now, does it mean that all patients with high-risk small myeloma should be started on lenalidomide dexamethasone? Not yet. I think it's too early. This was a relatively small trial with 120-odd patients, um, and there are some caveats to this study, especially in terms of how they selected the high-risk patients, and uh, especially since some of those patients may have been just uh, almost um, incipient myeloma. So let's just take a look at the um, next case. I'll try this again here. Let's see. Um. All right, let's, uh, let's try and vote on this. Not sure if anybody is able to do that. I don't see any numbers changing here. Okay, here we go. Right, I, you had to just trust my um, trust me on this one. So we have uh, forty-three percent of the people saying C and thirty-six percent saying A. So the first one is uh, careful observation, and three is lenalidomide dexamethasone. So if this question was posed uh, six months ago, um, the one would have been okay, but today I think the answer is actually C. And let's move on to what's happened uh, in terms of the. Um, definition of active uh, multiple myeloma. So traditionally, we have defined multiple myeloma as somebody with a monoclonal protein who also has CRAP features, which is the hypercalcemia, the renal insufficiency, anemia, and the bone disease. Now, a couple months, uh, three or four months ago now, um, there was an expanded definition of multiple myeloma that was published by the International Myeloma Working Group, adding uh, three more biomarkers or other characteristics to the definition of active multiple myeloma. So that included a bone marrow plasma cell percentage of more than 60%. So the case in question had an 80% plasma cytosis on the bone marrow, more than one PET or MRI lesion on the FLC ratio that is more than uh, 100. 
why, why did we do that? Because again, I think increasingly the field is moving towards, you know, we know patients with myeloma can present with um, extremely um, hard to treat complications, especially if they have neurological complications or renal failure. So what we have found through a variety of uh, different studies is that if you have one of these uh, characteristics, there's an 80% chance of getting symptomatic multiple myeloma over the next two years. So the question is, do we wait for the other shoe to drop, or do we actually intervene in some of these patients where we are absolutely sure that they are actually going to get symptomatic disease in a fairly short term? So the definition of myeloma has changed in the sense that these patients are now going to be considered as symptomatic disease and started on therapy, just as you would do currently with um, patients with CRAB. So in addition to the, um, the, the definition or the de definition for active disease, uh, the risk stratification also has changed over time. Now, as with all other cancers, it's very important for us to understand what is the risk uh, status for, of patients with myeloma, not only in terms of tailoring the therapy to best suit the needs of the patient, but also to so tell the patient what to expect from their disease in the long run. So the international staging system has been around for a while. It was developed uh, in 2000 by the International Myeloma Working Group using a couple of very uh, simple markers, which is the serum beta-2 microglobulin and serum albumin. And we knew at the time uh, that these two values would allow us to segregate these patients very nicely into three groups based on their overall survival. Since then, this, um, this um, algorithm has been applied even in groups of patients who are getting the more modern therapies, and it still holds true. Now, but what, what we have uh, realized over the past decade is that the genomic abnormalities in multiple myeloma are critical for their outcome or prognosis. Now, when we, start, when we were doing uh, metaphase cytogenetics, only about a third of the patients with myeloma would have any abnormalities because you have to have dividing cells to get metaphases, and myeloma is a low proliferative disease. However, when we started doing FISH looking for abnormalities, we realized that almost all patients with myeloma have at least one abnormality uh, in terms of uh, either a translocations involving chromosome 14, which is the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, or trisomies of odd-numbered chromosomes. And there's obviously going to be some overlap, and this group of patients can also have deletions involving chromosomes 1, 13, 14, and 17, either entire chromosomes or parts of chromosomes. So overall, and even in this uh, cohort of 500 patients, only about 3% of these patients actually had a normal fish, so to speak, and many of those patients actually had very low numbers of plasma cells. Now, what does it mean, the FISH findings? We know that if patients actually have any of these high-risk translocations, the 4, 14, 14, 16, 14, 20, or if they have deletion 13 on metaphase cytogenetics, a 17P on FISH, or metaphase cytogenetics, or um, 1P, or amplification of 1Q, these patients actually have an inferior outcome. So if you just look at the group of patients with these top three lines, their median overall survival is only about four, um, is three years, compared to about 86% of patients um, uh, alive at uh, six years um, if you have a standard risk of fish abnormality. So a significant difference between the two groups of patients. So what has happened over the past few months is that there's a very uh, recent publication in JCO by, from Dr. Palumbo and the International Myeloma Working Group, which essentially took the genetic features and combined that with the ISS to develop a revised international staging system, uh, which uh, incorporates both the ISS stages one to three and all the presence on uh, uh, fish of one of these abnormalities or an elevated LDH. So now you have a uh, RISS stage, which is one, two, or three, one being stage one ISS uh, with standard risk fish and normal LDH, and stage three is an ISS stage three uh, with either an abnormal fish or a high LDH. And everybody else goes in between. And you can again see it gives a really nice uh, segregation of these patients into three different groups with very different outcomes. So the diagnosis uh, and the risk stratification obviously is very critical right in the beginning for these patients. But what do we do next uh, in terms of actual therapy? Now, traditionally, uh, we always think about myeloma patients. Are they transplant eligible or ineligible before we decide on what therapy to give them? And I think that question is still very relevant in, the, in today's world. It may not be very relevant as to what you do initially with, for therapy because the therapies are increasingly converging to very common regimens for older and uh, younger patients. Especially with increasing avoidance of melphalan as part of the initial therapy, this may be a mood point in terms of deciding whether they are eligible or ineligible the day you see them. Because often those patients, when you see them, have significant uh, problems with pain, and they may not, the last thing they want to hear about is a transplant. So it's not maybe the appropriate time to decide if somebody is transplant eligible. 
But overall, the concept is that you want to start them on an effective initial therapy. We want to give them some kind of consolidation, either transplant or by continuing on this therapy, and eventually want starting to look at some kind of maintenance, all with the goal of continuing to work on the tumor burden where we can get them down to a extremely low numbers. So what are the different initial therapy options we have? Um, let's take a look at this particular case and the, just to highlight the importance of some of the risk stratification systems that we use in this uh, disease. So again, uh, the 62-year-old uh, woman who is diagnosed with myeloma, uh, some of the baseline characteristics are given here. A bone marrow shows 40% plasma cells, 414 on fish. So in addition to the initial management of hypercalcemia, which of the following is the best treatment option for these patients? Now I'll just go ahead and get this started. Let's see if that works. Okay, please go ahead and... Um, All right. Maybe, okay, it's still moving. All right, again, twin project, but uh, half of the people opted for uh, the choice E, and the next, uh, second one was uh, choice A, with uh, 10 people who voted for that, or about a third of the uh, group. So I think um, the, key, the two key aspects to this, one is the choice of the drug. Um, and we will see when the subsequent slides uh, how we can adapt um, the therapy to the risk stratification. Now here we are dealing with somebody who has 414 translocation, which we know is intermediate or high risk depending upon which uh, classification system you look at. And um, the, uh, the understanding that botasumib as a therapy is, uh, is appropriate for somebody with a 414 translocation. And the second key point being the prolonged therapy in patients with 414 translocation, uh, often till the disease progression uh, with a botasumib-based regimen. So what are the different uh, initial therapies that we uh, have available? So historically, we had the combination of the vincristine adrimacin dexamethasone, which was a standard workhorse for um, treating these patients for a long period of time. Then came along thalidomide, the lenalidomide, uh, and we started looking at the combinations of these uh, different drugs. Uh, so botasomib thalidomide dexamethasone, botasomib lenalidomide dexamethasone, and four drug combinations. And what we found uh, through various trials, phase two and phase three trials, is as we go up on these uh, combinations, we clearly see an increasing depth of response. Now, many of those early trials did not necessarily show, uh, especially in the context of autologous stem cell transplantation, an improvement in overall survival, though most of them did show improvement in PFS, depending upon the depth of response. Um, but the addition of more drugs also contributed to more toxicity. So um, I think the field is still trying to come up with regimens um, that are very efficacious, but at the same time very well tolerated in patients with uh, uh, myeloma who are undergoing initial therapy. So if you take a look at some of these uh, novel regimens, um, a good example would be the carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. So even within the class of immunomodulatory drugs, which includes the thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide, and the proteasome inhibitors, which is the prototype example is uh, botasomib, the effort has been in trying to develop, can we develop more effective agents within the same class? Can we develop agents which are of totally different mechanisms? And can we make these drugs much more easy to give? So carfilzomib is a second generation proteasome inhibitor which in the clinical trials have been shown to be quite effective. And this combination of lenalidomide, uh, carfilzomib, and dexamethasone was studied by Dr. Jakoboviak and colleagues in this phase two study where they were able to show that after four cycles of therapy in a group of 49 patients, almost 45% of these patients were in stringent complete response. That is much higher than what we typically see in the context of even an autologous stem cell transplant. So the question is, are we, you know, is, is what, what does this regimen um, offer for patients with multiple myeloma? Again, take into um, account, this is a phase two study. We need to have phase three trials to really ask that question. And there's an ongoing ECOG phase three that is actually looking at a comparison of botasomib lenalidomide dexamethasone versus uh, kyprolis lenalidomide and dexamethasone in patients with the standard risk multiple myeloma who have, been un who have not been treated. So I think we have to stay tuned as to where we're going to fit these kind of regimens into our uh, standard frontline approach.
Now, another approach has been to make this proteasome class of drug much more uh, easy to give. Now, the problem with both Velcade and, uh, or Botasimib and Carfilzomib has been that they need uh, to be given uh, parenterally. So the MLN9708 or uh, Ixazomib is an oral proteasome inhibitor that is currently going through clinical trials. And this was one of the initial phase two studies we did combining that with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And again, you can see that after four cycles of therapy, you have about half of the patients in a very good partial response. Um, and this response depth continues to increase as more, more patients get uh, additional cycles of therapy. And we have had patients who have been on study for over three years who've been continuing on maintenance uh, Ixazomib. So clearly there's... Um, there's increasing um, um, work that is being done in terms of identifying um, these classes of drugs that uh, work, more, not only work better, but can be given more conveniently. So one of the questions that always comes up is, what about autologous stem cell transplant? With all these new highly efficacious regimens, do we really need the, uh, stem cell transplant anymore? Um, the, I think the closest answer we have to that is probably the study that, we, uh, that was recently published by Dr. Palumbo and colleagues where he actually looked at patients getting a Lendex injection for four cycles and then randomized them to transplant versus MPR consolidation. And then they were re-randomized to maintenance versus no maintenance. And patients who actually got this uh, autologous peripheral blood stem cell transplant did do better in terms of survival outcomes compared to the ones who only got MPR um, uh, consolidation. Now, one could argue that MPR is probably an inappropriate or sub um, F, uh, therapeutic um, in consolidation therapy. And I think, yes, uh, to some extent, it's not as efficacious as some of the regimens we currently use. And I think some of the answer to this will probably come from the SWOG study um, that, um, um, that is looking at, again, um, different consolidation approaches versus uh, tandem transplants. So the other thing that, is, um, that has been addressed in the past in a prospective fashion was when do you give the autologous stem cell transplant? Do we do four cycles of injection therapy and do a stem cell transplant? Or do we continue to follow these patients on the injection therapy and do transplant as the first line of salvage therapy? The original French phase three trial clearly showed that there was no difference in the overall outcome, but a much better quality of life um, uh, metrics in patients who are getting an early autologous stem cell transplant. Now, is that true in the current era? There is a large IFM uh, study that we hopefully will hear some results of this coming ASH, which looked at a delayed autologous stem cell transplant versus an early transplant. But this is a retrospective study that we did at Mayo, which again looked at an early versus delayed, and we did not see any difference in the overall survival in patients who are undergoing initial therapy with either a thalidomide or lenalidomide-based regimen. Uh, the, one of the areas that has been of a lot of interest has been uh, tandem transplant. So if one transplant's good, two transplants must be better, right? So um, the initial study that was done by the French group clearly showed that there was an improvement in overall survival. It was quickly followed by four other randomized trials which showed no benefit in overall survival. And if you look at the meta-analysis of those randomized trials, even though there's an improvement in PFS, there was no clear improvement in um, uh, overall survival with tandem transplant, except for some subgroups who failed to achieve a very good partial response to the first, first transplant. Now, this is a data that was presented by um, Dr. Cavo at, a couple of years ago at ASH, again, looking at uh, pooled analysis of European phase three studies. And he was able to show that in patients who were getting two, tandem or two transplants versus one transplant, there was an improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival. But when he kind of uh, looked into it more um, uh, in depth, most of the benefit was seen in patients with high-risk disease, especially the ones with deletion 17P and 414. So there's probably a role for the tandem transplant, but we really need to find out who benefits the most uh, before we use that routinely. Now, the next question is, can we actually make the transplants better, right? We have been using MEL200 for 20 years and it doesn't really change much. With all the new drugs coming on, maybe we can make it different. So this is a French trial that looked at combining four doses of botasomib before and after uh, melflan. And when they looked at the results with this uh, modified conditioning regimen, they saw, compared to the historical controls, they had a much more deeper response, even though the overall survival and uh, progression-free survival outcomes are still not very clear. Now, what else can we do after transplant? Now, one of the approaches is to give more consolidation therapy. And this is a study that was done by Dr. Kawa, again, showing that as you give more and more therapy, so there's injection, two transplants, and consolidation, there's an increasing depth of response, as you can see with this blue bar, which is the complete response. So clearly, there is additional cytoreduction that can be achieved by uh, giving uh, drugs um, as part of injection, then the transplant, and the post-transplant consolidation or maintenance. 
the biggest question that we, the bigger question that we haven't been clearly uh, been able to answer has been what depth of response is adequate for a given patient and when do we call it a day um, for um, treatment of myeloma. And we'll come touch upon that in a little bit. But uh, one of the other strategies has been maintenance. It's been tested for uh, decades. The initial studies looked at steroids and interferon. Um, but the more recent studies have looked at, initially with thalidomide, the, the trials, especially the uh, initial tr French trials and the Australian trials, showed that there's some overall survival advantage for using thalidomide maintenance. But the toxicity, especially the neuropathy, was significant for thalidomide maintenance. And most patients could not stay on it beyond a year. Now, lenalidomide as maintenance therapy post-transplant has been studied by both the um, the, the, the group in the U.S., which is the CALGB, as well as the French group, both showing a, uh, Im almost a doubling of the PFS from about two years to four years, but the overall survival was no different in the French group and was significantly better for the maintenance in the U.S. group. Now, there are some very critical differences between the two trials, so there's, the jury is still out as to whether we should be using maintenance lenalidomide on every patient with multiple myeloma undergoing a stem cell transplant. In our own center, we have been using more of an adapted, risk-adapted approach. Patients who still have residual disease after the autologous stem cell transplant, we have been using lenalidomide maintenance in the standard risk setting and bortezomib maintenance in the high-risk setting. And some of the data, again, comes from the, um, the, the Howard study, which looked at bortezomib as part of injection as well as bortezomib as part of maintenance, where they went back and looked at those group of patients and saw that the ones with deletion 17P had the best outcome when they were treated with bortezomib-based injection and bortezomib-based maintenance after a tandem autologous stem cell transplant. So I think for high-risk patients, it makes sense uh, for us to put them on long-term bortezomib therapy, whether you call them continued therapy, consolidation, maintenance, whatever name you want to give it, these patients do need continued suppressive therapy with a proteasome inhibitor. Now, what about the, uh, the majority of patients with myeloma who are, cannot undergo a stem cell transplant? So, you know, these... The, the age limit for um, transplant depends on the age of the physicians most of the time, I guess. But um, the, uh, you know, it's very variably defined. The Europeans think 65 is a drop-dead cutoff. Uh, in U.S., we transplant patients all the way up to 78, 79, depending upon how they look, uh, how, many hold, um, how much uh, golf they can play. But um, the, the older patients, the, the therapy has historically been melphalan prednisone until um, the melphalan prednisone thalidomide trials were done, clearly showed that thalidomide led to a better overall survival when it was added to melphalan prednisone. Then the VISTA trial added bortezomib to melphalan prednisone and showed that uh, gave better overall survival. So the melphalan prednisone thalidomide and the melphalan prednisone bortezomib kind of became the uh, standard regimens for this transplant in eligible patient population. But the biggest question has been, we all know whom, uh, when we use melphalan, these patients can have a significant residual hematological toxicity. Especially when you have new, novel, and more effective drugs coming through, the last thing we want to do is to kind of make the bone marrow unsuitable for any kind of new therapies in the long run. So there's been increasing interest in trying to develop regimens that um, does not uh, cause that problem, so kind of take the melphalan out of that initial therapy picture. So the French trial, the first trial actually looked at lenalidomide dexamethasone given for 18 months versus continuous lenalidomide dexamethasone versus melphalan prednisone and thalidomide. And they were able to show that the continuous lenalidomide dexamethasone actually improved the PFS as well as the overall survival uh, in patients with newly diagnosed myeloma who could not undergo stem cell transplant. So clearly there's proof uh, that, uh, that we can have a melphalan-free regimen for these patients uh, for the initial therapy. You know, there's also been the kind of the similar approach as in the younger patients. Can we actually add multiple drugs to make more efficacious combinations? Can we also give this drug for longer period of time in maintenance strategies? So one example of such a study is the one from Dr. Palumbo, where he looked at uh, bortezomib, melphalan, prednisone, thalidomide, followed by bortezomib, thalidomide maintenance, and he was able to show that there was an improved overall survival and progression-free survival when patients uh, did that. So... Um, Clearly, the therapies are changing. We have better therapies. We have better combinations. We can get deeper responses uh, to therapy. And we also know that by keeping these patients on prolonged therapy, we certainly can prevent the prog the, delay the progression and in some instances also delay or improve the overall survival. I think the important thing for us going forward is to understand that this is not a uh, homogeneous disease. It's in fact very heterogeneous. Uh, we just haven't found the terms like the lymphoma folks have done. We just still all call them multiple myeloma. But there are clearly groups of patients within myeloma who needs 
to be treated very aggressively, need more effective regimens up front and more, need more prolonged therapy. And we also have our follicular lymphoma equivalents whom we can probably no, uh, do with less uh, duration of therapy and maybe even less intense therapy. So we need to do that. Uh, but um, clearly, you know, we need to take into account the quality of life impact of prolonged therapy, the cost of care, and also some of the other issues like second malignancies associated with long-term uh, uh, treatments. But in addition to all these, uh, th the active therapy, there's also significant improvements that have been made in supportive care management. And just one example is uh, the uh, bisphosphonates. Now, this is the UK MRC trial, which looked at the zolodronic acid versus chlorodronic acid. It's an oral bisphosphonate. And they were able to show that there's about a six-month overall survival improvement by giving zolodronic acid continuously at time of diagnosis, irrespective of whether the patients had bone lesions or not. So I think it should be a standard of care for all patients with multiple myeloma to get a bisphosphonate on a regular basis. Um, most of the time, we use it on a monthly basis for at least a couple of years. Now, there are still some questions as to whether do we need it every month? Can we do with every quarter, especially something like zolotronic acid, which stays around forever? And do we need to give it for more than two years? And those are the questions that are currently being addressed in some of the phase three trials. So the problem is now we have to confront the inevitable, like the most of these patients with myeloma are going to come back with relapsed disease. And what we have seen over time is that these patients get repeated different regimens, and with each regimen, their duration of response and the depth of response continue to go down. So the tumor clone is continuously adapting to the different therapies we give, and they increasingly become resistant to the therapies we can throw at them. And this is a study that was done through the International Myeloma Working Group, which showed that in patients who relapse or who cannot get an IMID or a proteasome inhibitor, their median overall survival uh, was only nine months, and the median even free survival was five months. So very poor outcome once you get refractory to those two very effective class of drugs. Now, clearly, this was several years ago, and since then, several drugs have come through uh, the clinic, um, both, uh, some of which have been approved since then. So what happens in terms of this clonal evolution? What we have realized is there is obviously the, there's a clonal tide that happens. There are clones that are present in the beginning, which go away with a specific therapy, but then start coming back when you switch therapies. And there are clones which continue to uh, get more and more abnormalities, and there are also early clones which can develop additional abnormalities uh, and start um, appearing at the time of relapse. And one of the things that has been very striking has been uh, these abnormalities are more likely to happen in patients with high risk, which probably explains why patients with these, some of the high-risk translocations uh, don't do very well. So there have been a lot of studies looking at whole, ex whole genome sequencing in these patients. Uh, what is striking is there's a whole variety of abnormalities we can see in these patients. But the most common changes are not present in more than 3 or 4% of these uh, uh, patients. So clearly, there's a vast number of abnormalities that, ha that evolve over time, which makes it quite challenging when we think about personalized medicine or individualized medicine in these uh, folks. We also know that um, um, we, can, we have identified several mechanisms of resistance to the currently used drugs. For example, cerebellum has been identified as a key target, and we know that uh, myeloma cells which have um, low expressors of cerebellum don't, do res don't respond very well to the immunomodulatory class of drugs. Now, many of these changes haven't quite reached the clinic, uh, but I, it, um, people are working on trying to get uh, these um, things to the clinic so that we can individualize our therapy. But there are also several promising drugs in the offing. So there are some old drugs uh, new to myeloma. There are some new drugs which are the same class as what we have, but better and improved versions. And there are totally new classes of drugs. So bendamustine is something that we uh, talked about in the context of lymphoma. But even in myeloma, this drug which kind of uh, made its appearance from behind the, um, uh, from the Cold War era beyond the Iron Curtain here. Um, so we know that uh, it is very effective. In fact, phase three trials have shown that the bendamustine in combination with thalidomide um, and prednisone in the upfront setting can have um, good outcomes. We have studied that, we and others have studied that combinations uh, with lenalidomide and bortezomib, again showing that in patients with relapsed uh, refractory disease, nearly half of these patients can have good response, um, and which are often uh, fairly durable. Now, pomalidomide is the latest of the immunomodulatory drugs to enter the clinic. This is already approved. It's an oral drug taken in a similar fashion to lenalidomide. Um, and if you look at the response rates across these different phase two studies that were done, you can see that it varies anywhere from about a quarter of these patients to nearly half of the patients, depending upon the type or the prior therapies they have had.
Now, this is the phase three trial that looked at pomeldomide low dose dex versus high dose dexamethasone, and they were able to show that there's a substantial improvement in the overall survival when patients were treated with pomeldomide and low dose dex. <coughs> so, cofilzomib is a um, next generation proteasome inhibitor. In co contrast to botasomib, it's a irreversible, um, it has irreversible binding to the uh, proteasome subunit. And what, is, what has been striking in the preclinical work has been there is very limited, if any, neurotoxicity with cofilzomib compa uh, con compared to what we saw with botasomib. So this is a compilation of studies with a lot of different numbers, but I just want to focus on this particular line here, uh, again, showing that in patients um, uh, getting cofilzomib as a single agent, you can have as high as half of the patients responding, especially if they have never seen the proteasome inhibitor class of drugs. And some of these responses can be fairly deep as well, as shown in this complete response. And we already saw that the combination of lenalidomide, cofilzomib, dexamethasone are also quite effective, both in the relapse setting and the newly diagnosed. So the ASPAIR trial, which was presented at the last ASH, compared patients who had, had one to three prior lines of therapy and randomized them to cofilzomib uh, with lenalidomide dex versus lenalidomide dex, and they were able to show a significant improvement, almost a nine-month improvement in the progression-free survival, and the trend towards improved overall survival using the triplet versus the um, doublet. Now, MLN 9708, um, or exazomib, has also been um, studied in uh, relapsed refractory disease. Uh, there have been two phase two studies, um, phase one, two studies that have looked at once weekly dosing and twice weekly dosing. Both of them show in a heavily pretreated group of patients um, um, clinical responses that are meaningful. So uh, this one, uh, there's a phase three study that the results will be present at ASH this year, um, and hopefully the, some of these drugs will be available for us to use in the clinic soon. But what has been one of the most exciting area for myeloma, um, it has been monoclonal antibodies, which has been long time in coming. We've been just uh, um, extremely jealous of our lymphoma colleagues who have had rituximab with them for almost two decades now. So elotizumab is the first monoclonal antibody that has uh, been studied, at least um, successfully in the clinic so far. Now, um, SLAM F7 or uh, uh, CS1 is a glycoprotein that is very high, uh, expressed very highly on plasma cells with very limited expression on other cells. And elotizumab is a uh, monoclonal antibody that targets the SLAM F7, which can kill these myeloma cells both uh, by direct activation of some of the um, NK cells, um, as well as tagging these myeloma cells for uh, recognition by the immune cells. So the eloquence study that was presented last ASH showed that there is um, a significant improvement in the progression-free survival in patients with myeloma with relapsed disease who had one to three prior lines of therapy. So very similar cohort as we saw with the ASPAIR trial. Uh, but these patients were all lenalidomide um, naive for most part, and they were randomized to Lendex versus elotizumab Lendex an improvement of about six months in terms of progression-free survival. Again, no difference in overall survival, uh, but the PFS clearly showing that this drug is efficacious. This is extremely important in this, if you, when you take, it into, con take into consideration the fact that the single-agent elotizumab trials really did not show any efficacy. So clearly what we are seeing here is, prob is what is coming from the combination of an immunomodulatory drug along with a monoclonal antibody. Now, daratumumab is another uh, monoclonal antibody that is uh, targeted against CD38. Now, CD38 is uh, highly expressed in plasma cells, but it is also expressed on a variety of other immune cells, including activated T cells. Um, so not as specific as, um, the, uh, as we saw with the SLAM F7. But the clinical trials, the early trials show that the significant um, uh, activity in patients who have seen multiple therapies, many of these studies, many of the patients in these early studies have seen five, median of five prior lines of therapy. And you can see that even in those patients, we can get some deep responses. So uh, deratumumab is clearly something that is, um, that is quite exciting. We saw some very exciting data from the last um, ASCO, and um, uh, there was a recent paper that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from Law Course and Group, which shows that about a 36% overall response rate in a highly pretreated group of patients um, with a median of five prior lines of therapy. So um, the SAR-651984, it has a different name now. Um, again, very similar uh, to daratumumab. It also targets a CD38, uh, even though there's some uh, hypothesis, maybe the immunological mechanisms may be slightly different in terms of mechanism of action. I think they are essentially um, same. Um, and what we have seen is, with, the, with this drug also, significant activity has been seen both as single agent and in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Uh, 
I'll briefly touch upon the histone deacetylase inhibitors. We do have one of the drug in this class that is approved for use, that is panobinostat or LBH 589. Um, again, uh, multiple mechanisms have been um, uh, suggested, uh, particularly in combination with uh, botasumib. Uh, this has uh, been shown to be um, efficacious, and this is the Panorama study which showed an improvement in the PFS when you combine um, HDAC inhibitors with the uh, botasumib. Um, Dinocyclib is a CDK inhibitor. There are several CDK inhibitors currently going through clinical trials, and here also we were able to see some hint of activity and the combination studies with botasumib is currently ongoing. RA520 of Felanesib is a kinesin spindle protein inhibitor. Um, again, these early trials clearly show that there's activity. Uh, with single agent, there's a 16% overall response rate, and it has also been used in combination with dexamethasone, and it's going through some of the um, uh, larger studies right now. Afrocertib, it's a PA3, um, it's an AKT inhibitor that also has been studied both single agent and in combination with botasumib. Uh, this is the monotherapy study, again showing you can see some responses uh, with these more targeted drugs. Again, I think the future of uh, relapse trial or multiple myeloma therapy is not necessarily going to be single agents. I think it's going to lie in combinations. I think overall, if you were to generalize our approach to relapse disease, I think patients should uh, be treated with uh, drugs that we know have worked before, at least in the beginning. Since no therapy is curative, I think all options should be tried, many of them sequentially. And what we really lack is, the, is good data on optimum sequence. Does drug A need to come before drug B, or can it be the other way around? And um, I think participation in clinical trials is going to be the key. So as we get more and more drugs with um, a new mechanism of action, I think we're going to start seeing more deeper responses and more prolonged responses. And I think uh, we, I, we hope that we can uh, cure some of these patients in the not too distant future. Um, again, you know, the cure definition can be different for different people. A 75-year-old person with myeloma who lives to 90 and dies of myocardial infarction is cured from my perspective. Uh, a 40-year-old with myeloma who has to live another 50 years, I think we really need to figure out how to keep them alive for 50 years. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you all for your attention.